The following message is a production of Tony Broom Ministries. We want to put faith at our fingertips. That's what this little session is about this evening, putting faith at your fingertips. You think about faith. Faith is simply deciding to believe that God will do what He said He will do. That's what faith is. You can look it up in the Bible. You can look it up in the commentary. You can look it up in all these pamphlets and books and things that are written about faith. But it really comes down to believing that God will do what He said He will do. So if we're going to believe that God will do what He said He will do, we need to know and learn what God said He will do. You're not going to believe what God said He will do if you don't know what He said that He will do. How can I believe what God said? And I believe He'll do what He said, but I have to know what He said before I can believe that God will do what He will do, what He said. I have to know what He said before I can believe it. It's not really that you're putting faith at your fingertips. It's not really that you have it at your fingertips. It's only an expression to help us to grasp faith, to get a hold of faith, to put faith within reach, make it simple for all. Put it on the bottom shelf where the kiddies can get a hold to it. Make faith where you can reach it. We talk about faith and if faith is way up in the sky or way out there somewhere where nobody can get a hold of it, and you can talk about faith all you want to, but if it's not in the reach of anyone, if it's not in the grasp of anyone, then it won't do anyone any good because you're talking about it, you're trying to reason about it, you're trying to explain about it, but no one can get a hold to it. No one can touch it. No one can activate it. No one can do anything with it. So what is faith? Well, we know the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And that first word of that verse says now faith is. Faith is not future nor is faith past. Those in the past may have had faith, and those in the future shall have faith, but faith is not past, nor is it future. Faith is now. Faith is present tense. Now faith is. And if faith is now, what is it now? It is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That tells me that faith has substance. Faith is not just a force. Faith is not just something that you talk about, but you cannot reach it. You cannot grasp it. It doesn't have any way to access it. The Scripture teaches the opposite. The Scripture says that you can access faith. It says that you can get a hold of faith. It says that you can touch faith, that you can work in faith, that you can operate in faith. That's what the Scripture tells us. Faith is the substance. What is the substance of things hoped for? If you already have what you're hoping for, you don't have to have faith for it because you already have it. But faith is what you have until you get what you're going to get. Amen. Faith is like that coupon that I give you that says, go ahead and go out there to the buffet. Go ahead and go out there to the fish house. Go ahead and go out there to the steakhouse. Your meal is already paid for. And you can say, thank you there, Uncle Broom, for giving me my gift certificate. Thank you for paying for my meal. I think that was a mighty good thing for you to do. It was just mighty nice of you for do that for me. And I thank you so much for it. I'm going to put this in my pocket and take it. And when I get home this evening, I'm going to put it in my nightstand. And I'm just going to adore it the rest of my life. I just thank you for what you've done. Well, that's good, but you hadn't 
gone out there and chawed down on anything. It's paid for. It's all covered. All expenses. As a matter of fact, you don't even have to pay any taxes on it. Everything's already taken care of. But if you never go out and take advantage of it, it doesn't do you any good. So if you are hoping for something, but you never access it, then it doesn't do you any good. So you have the certificate that says it's already yours, but until you go and take advantage of what that certificate gives you, then it hasn't done you any good. So faith says that everyone in the world has the gift certificate already been given to them. It's already been paid in full. The price has been paid in full. And we know that because we're saved and we are in the family of God. Prices have been paid in full and we are taking advantage of that. We have benefits of that. But the thing is, that is true for every individual on this earth and every individual who has been born and is born and will be born, the price is already covered in full for them. Now, whether they take advantage of it or not, it's just like that gift certificate you take home and put in the nightstand. You don't go out there to the outback and you don't eat up on that meal. It's already covered for you and paid for, but it's your choice as to whether you go out there and get it, take advantage of it or not. It's like Israel. God gave Israel the land. You can read it over and over in your Bible. God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob. I have given you the land. All you got to do is go in and possess it. But they still had to go in and possess it. Their problem was they didn't take advantage of all God gave them. God gave it all to them. And He still gives it all to them. But they don't take advantage of it. God gave Messiah, Yeshua, to them. He's theirs. He came to them. He came into His own. But His own received Him not. They chose to reject Him. He paid the price for Israel as a nation, as a people, as an individual. They chose to reject Him. That was their choice. So faith is the substance of what you're hoping for. And not only does faith have substance, it has evidence. Evidence. When you do a crime, someone does a crime, they have evidence that's stacked against them. And the evidence says you have done thus and so. And now the evidence is speaking against you. And so faith has evidence. The evidence of things not seen. You don't see it yet. Because if you already see it, you don't have to have faith to have what you already see because you already have it. But faith is what you have till you get what you're going to get. Faith is that gift card that you have that takes you into that place and says, I am here because Pastor Broom done paid for my meal and I can sit down here and eat and I don't have to pay anything because the price is already paid. I have the evidence in my hand that says it's already done. And now I'm here to take advantage of it. So we're using faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. That's what faith is. Where does faith come from? Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Now, if I ask you a question... A lot of times around South Henderson, we don't like to answer a question because we think that it's a setup. I'm not going to answer it because he's trying to trick me, trying to set me up. But this is not a trick question. What if I were to ask you, what is the greatest miracle in the world? What would you say? Huh? Salvation. salvation. Is there any greater miracle than salvation? No, it's not, is it? So you didn't even want to answer that because you think you're going to be set up for something. You call it conversion, call it new birth, call it whatever you, Christianity, it's still salvation. There's no greater miracle than salvation. So what did the verse say again? By grace are you saved. Saved, that's the miracle. 
It's the grace. It's the mercy of God. By grace are you saved through faith. So if salvation is the greatest miracle in the world, that means that you already have used faith to have the greatest miracle that anybody could ever have. You are saved, aren't you? You love Jesus, don't you? He lives in your heart, doesn't He? You know Him as your Savior, don't you? Well, that means that you have already exercised faith. You didn't get saved because you had a lot of money. You didn't get saved because you're good looking. You didn't get saved because you went to a certain church. You got saved because you put faith, you exercised faith in Jesus Christ, and therefore you're saved. You have already used your faith to take advantage of that gift card, to take advantage of the greatest miracle of all, and that's salvation. You think I ain't even going to be halfway excited about that? I'm talking about salvation. So if we can use faith, and I know that use is a loose word, but we use it in the right way. If we can use exercise faith to take advantage and get the benefits of the greatest miracle in the world, and you've already used faith to get saved, to be saved. By grace are you saved through faith, and that is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. That's where faith comes from. It comes from God. Faith doesn't come from your mama. Faith doesn't come from your grandpa. It may come through them in a way that they have influenced your life through living in Christian life. But faith doesn't come from them. Faith is not familial. It doesn't come in a family way. If you're looking for something to come through a family tree, that's a familiar spirit. You better leave it alone. Faith doesn't come that way. Because if faith came that way, that means that your family would have a better connection than mine. So you have more faith than I do. You have a greater connection to faith than I do. But faith comes to everyone alike. That means you have no more advantage of me. I have no more advantage of it than you do. By grace, you're saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Faith comes to every individual as a gift of God. We don't even have the capacitance, the capacity to have faith ourselves. We cannot conjure up faith ourselves. We cannot come up with faith ourselves. You can belch and burp all you want to and cough and do every gag and do all this other stuff. You'll never come up with faith. You might come up with a lot of hock, but you won't come up with no faith. Faith doesn't come that way. You cannot work up faith. You cannot strain up faith. You cannot even pray down faith. Faith is a gift of God. It's given to you. So that's where faith comes from. The ability to believe God comes from God. Everything we have comes from God. Salvation is of God. Sanctification is of God. Spirit baptism is of God. Divine healing is from God. Second coming of Jesus, that comes because of God. Everything we have is because of God. And even the faith to believe God to get what you need comes from God. It's all about Him. But I'm glad I'm in on the gravy. Get in on the benefits. By grace are you saved through faith. And that is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. That's where faith comes from. Now how does one have faith? Mark chapter 11 verse 22, And Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. How does one have faith? We have faith by having faith in God. Well, that sounds like a, a rose is a rose is a rose. But is the question, how does one have faith? You have faith by doing what Jesus said. Jesus said, have faith in God. He didn't say jump over a tree. He didn't say climb up to the moon. He didn't say do all these. He just said have faith in God. Well, how do I have faith in God? All you've got to do is just do what Jesus said. We look for some big thing that we have to accomplish. If he had told you some big thing to do to get cleansed of leprosy, would you not have done it? Some big money, some big offering? And all he told you to do was just simply wash and be clean. If I was you, Master, that's what I'd do. The old boy said, you know what, I believe you're right. And he went and he dipped himself in Jordan seven times and he came up like a newborn baby. He just did what God told him to do. 
That's what we need to do, is just do what Jesus said. Jesus answering said unto them, have faith in God. You get faith from God in order to be able to have faith in God. You get faith from God in order to be able to have faith in God. Jesus said, have faith in God. Well, how can I do that? Because I already have faith from God. And if I have faith from God, that means I can have faith in God. See how simple it is? Amen. I'm glad it is because if it were not so simple, a little guy like me couldn't understand it. To every man is given or dealt the measure of faith, according to Romans chapter 12, verse 3. God has given every man the measure of faith. Do you say, well, do you really believe that every man has faith? Paul says every man does not have saving faith, and what he meant by that was every man does not take advantage of the faith that God gives them. But everyone has faith. The scripture here, and you can look at it for yourself, Romans 12, 3, to every man is given or dealt the measure of faith. Every man has faith. Every woman, every boy and girl, especially those who have reached the age of accountability, they have faith. God gives everyone faith. Because if God didn't give everyone faith, that means that the ones who had faith would have an advantage over the ones who didn't have faith. But no one has advantage over another because everyone has been given the measure of faith. That's where faith comes from. How does one have faith? One has faith because God gives it to you. It's a gift of God. Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes as a gift of God and it comes through the vehicle of God's word. As you hear the word of God, I don't know how to tell you this any other way to just tell you like it is. But I have a problem with Christians who call themselves Christians and they have a problem. They don't want to hear the Word of God. They don't want to be around the Word of God. They don't want to be taught by the Word of God. They don't enjoy reading the Word of God. They don't enjoy listening to the Word of God. There's a problem. There's a dead cat on the line. Where's your life coming from? Where's your vine juice coming from? It's got to be from that Word of God. We ought to be happy when the Word is taught and preached. And there was a time in the church when they were excited about the Word of God. And that's why they had power with God. And that's why the sick were healed. And that's why people were saved. And that's why people were sanctified. And that's why people were baptized in the Holy Ghost. Because they had Pentecostal power and they were excited about God's Word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. The more that you hear the Word of God, the more that you have faith. And the more that you have faith, the more that you want to hear the Word of God. And the more you want to hear the Word of God, the more you'll hear the Word of God. And the more that you hear the Word of God, the more that you'll have faith. It just keeps on going. Amen. Well, that's what the verse says right here. If you read it, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Amen. So faith is coming by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Word of God. Faith comes, and it just goes on and on. It's a Christian boomerang circle. That's what it is. It just keeps on going on and on. Rolling round and round. Rocking my soul in the bosom of Abraham. Where does faith reside? Where does faith live? Where does it reside? We could say it lives in heaven with the Lord, but where does faith reside? In Romans 10, 8, But what saith it? And that it is the righteousness which is of faith. What does the righteousness of faith say? That's the question. What saith it? What says the righteousness of faith? Or we might say it like this. What does the righteousness of faith say? And here's what it says. The word is nigh thee, or near thee, near you, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is, the word of faith which we preach. So where does faith reside? We could say, of course, that it resides in the Word of God. That's where it comes from. The vehicle that it comes through is the Word of God. And that's how it comes to us. But where does it reside? When something or someone resides somewhere, they live there. They reside there. That's your residence. Where does faith have residence? The verse here said, the righteousness of faith says that faith 
is in our mouth and in our heart because that's where the Word is. Where is the Word? The Word is nigh thee. It's near to you. You don't have to go over the sea to get it. You don't have to go up into the sky. You don't have to go down into the deep. The Word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. All you got to do is just say it. All you got to do is just believe it. Praise God. That's where the Word is. It's in your mouth. If it's in your mouth, you just speak it. If it's in your heart, you just believe it. That's that word of faith that we preach. How do you activate faith? In Luke chapter 8, verse 50, But when Jesus heard it, Don't trouble the master anymore. Your daughter's already dead. Might as well pack up and go home. But when Jesus heard that, He heard it, He answered him saying, Fear not, Oh, glory to God. How many times have He had to tell you that? Don't be afraid. Fear not. Believe only. And she shall be made whole. There again. He didn't say go to the bank. Take out a bunch of money. By the way, when I'm telling things like it is, I might as well just go ahead and tell you like it is about what I feel about this. And that is this. You can build churches to hell freezes over until Jesus comes back. But I don't believe God's people ought to go in debt to do stuff like that. I don't believe you ought to put God's people in servitude and in debt. I don't believe families ought to go in debt. Sometimes you have to. I understand that. But you take a bunch of people and you put them together and you say, we're going to build thus and so. We're going to take out a $5 million loan. You're going to pay interest out of your nose too. I don't believe you ought to put God's people in bondage. The Bible says, Oh, no man anything but to love one another. Amen. Now, nobody goes by that, but I'm just telling you what the Bible says, and that's what I believe. You ought not put God's people under servitude and under debt. And then you want people, Woo! Worship God in the Holy Ghost. No, you can't. You done burden me down with a bunch of debt. Jesus didn't tell this man go to the bank and borrow a bunch of money. He didn't tell him to do a bunch of things. He said, this is what you do. Don't fear, only believe. Amen. Believe only, and she shall be made whole. We have complicated it too much. Jesus said, just believe. Amen. Well, I believe, but nothing didn't happen. You've got to keep on believing. Well, how do you say that? Because He didn't tell you to do anything else. He said only believe. Well, if He said only believe, that's what I'm doing. I can't do nothing else. So I just believe. That's what I can do. Isn't it simple? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and what? Thou shalt be saved. If you've already used your faith to take advantage of the greatest miracle in the world, then you can use that same faith to take advantage of any other miracle, which is a less miracle if there's way to say such a thing. Healing is wonderful. All the things and blessings of God are wonderful, but salvation is the greatest thing. And if you've already used your faith, the faith that God gives you, it's your faith that comes from God. If you've already used faith to take advantage of the greatest miracle in the world, then you can only believe for healing. You can believe for salvation. You can believe for sanctification. You can believe for all the blessings of God. Mark 9, 23, Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. My boy's sick. He's convulsing. He's having a demon. He's having a hard time. Jesus said, All you got to do is believe. If you can just believe. And the man had been to the disciples. They were not successful in casting him out. Jesus didn't put them down for it. He just said, It's because of your unbelief. And this kind does not go out to prayer and fasting. Sometimes you need to pray. Sometimes you need to fast. But the big thing is unbelief. He didn't put them down. Instead of putting them down, he just said, Well, that's all right. You tried. Now bring him to me. Let's really get something done about it. Master, I've been to the disciples. They couldn't do it. But if you can do anything, help us. At that point, he was in despair, wasn't he? If you can do anything, help us. Jesus didn't allow him to stay in that unbelief. He just said, all you've got to do is believe. If you can believe, all things are possible. If we can believe, there's nothing impossible. We activate faith 
by believing and we declare what we believe by what we speak. We activate faith. How do you activate faith? How do you turn it on? How do you activate it? You activate faith by believing. If you can believe, all things are possible. Faith is like a inanimate object. Faith is like a wood. It's like a pulpit. It's like a dummy. It's like a casket. Faith is a noun. Without works, faith is dead. Faith without works is dead. You have all the faith in the world. Talk about all the faith you have. But faith that doesn't do anything is dead faith. Faith then is a noun, but believe is a verb, is an action. You believe, and when you believe, it puts your faith to work. When you believe, it activates your faith. We activate faith by believing, and we declare what we believe by what we speak. We say we believe thus and so because and through what we say, what we speak. From 2 Corinthians 4.13, According as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak. Sometimes we are not speaking because we don't believe. Now we say we believe, but when it comes time to speak forth, we become mute. The devil gets a gotcha hold on us. He puts a lockjaw on us because he knows that if we start speaking words of faith, we activate faith by speaking and declaring what we believe. And he knows that if we start speaking God's word, then he has to let go and let us loose and he has to flee. We start speaking God's word. I believe. You can say, I believe, I believe, I believe, staggerly, magali, I believe. <laughs> but that doesn't do anything. What do you believe? I believe and therefore have I spoken. I believe that the sick will get well. I believe that it's going to turn around. I believe it's not going to be this way always. I believe that no matter how you see things right now, God will bring it forth. And I believe that my situation is going to turn around. Mark chapter 11, verses 23 and 24. And Jesus had already said in verse 22, Now have faith in God. This fig tree that you cursed, it's dried up by the roots. And if you'll read that story, you'll know that it didn't dry up from the outside in, from the branches down. It dried up from the roots out. Dried up from the roots up. The visible branches, they didn't see that dry up to start with. It dried up from the roots and then it came to the outside. And the next day they looked and that fig tree had been dried up. And Master Peter and those said, Behold, that fig tree that you cursed, that you rebuked, has dried up. And Jesus said, All you got to do is have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, if you have faith, it will cause you to rise up. It will cause you to speak forth God's Word. You're talking about Pentecostal power. That's what it's all about. Faith and power go together. Speaking unto this mountain. And you say, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Now it's so easy to make fun of this verse and talk about a real mountain and talking about speaking and you don't really think that if you speak that something's going to move and get out of the way like a mountain, do you? Well, that's what Jesus said. That's exactly what He said. You can make fun of Him if you want to, but He's the eternal Son of God. He's the eternal Word of God. And He's the one that says, Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed. We done got so high class and cute that we don't think that Jesus really meant what he said. That's our problem. We can't believe because we done gotten away from the simplicity of the gospel. <laughs> be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea. Now he said this will happen to a physical mountain if you need for it to happen. But our problem is not 
Stone Mountain in Georgia. Our problem is not Mount Ares. My, our problem is not the things like that. Our problem is the mountains that get in our way, the problems and mountains in our life. And we have the power through the Word of God and faith to speak to that mountain and say, Get out of my way, sickness. Get out of my way, blindness. Get out of my way, lameness. Get out of my way, cancer. Get out of my way, debt. Get out of my way, discouragement. Get out of my way, things of the world. Get out of my way, temptation. Who call them a sickle of a child? Glory to God. Oh, hallelujah. Not only do you need to get out of my way, you need to be cast into the sea. You need to come plunk in the ocean. Come plunk in the name of Jesus. Get out of my way. Shall not doubt in his heart. This is a problem sometimes. We think just because we have a doubt thought. Oh, I'm doubting. I'm not going to get it because the devil made me doubt. No, if you have a doubt thought, there's not a breathing mammal human upon this earth who does not have thoughts of doubt. Jesus didn't say if you have a doubt thought. He said if you do not doubt in your heart. There's a lot of times when I have thoughts of doubt, but it ain't in my heart. My heart is still believing. My heart is still believing God. It's still standing on the promises of God. Whether I see anything change or not, I'm standing on the promises of God. God is helping somebody with this tonight. It might just be me. He said if you don't doubt in your heart, don't allow doubt to come into your heart to start second-guessing God and His Word. That's what doubt in the heart is. But just because you have a doubt in your mind, just because you have a thought in your mind, a doubt thought, that doesn't mean that your heart is in doubt. But he shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Because even though I have a thought of doubt in my mind, that doesn't mean that I've stopped believing that those things which I believe will come to pass. And Jesus said it right here. You don't doubt in your heart. You speak it. You don't doubt in your heart. You believe that those things which you say will come to pass. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire. What things? Things? Oh, don't talk about things. It's bad to have things, is it? God made all things. Not bad to have things. It's not bad to have things. It's bad when things have you. And that's what he said right here. What things soever you desire when you pray. Believe that you receive them and you shall have them. When you pray... Nobody may not hear you, but you can speak in prayer those things you're believing for. Therefore I say unto you, all things, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Jesus said that, God said that, and he's big enough to back up his word. Faith and Pentecostal power go together. From Acts chapter 6 verses 5 and 8, and they chose Stephen. A man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. I don't care if you call them bored. I don't care. And I'm not talking them B-O-R-E-D. Sometimes it's that, they get that way too. But I'm, that B-O-A-R-D, administrative council, I don't care if you call them elders. And we have those. I don't care if you call them deacons. I don't care what it is. The qualification still should be, they should be a man of faith, full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> How can you lead a Pentecostal church if you ain't got the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Oh, he's a good businessman. That don't mean anything. People who are lost in sin can be good business people, but they're not going to direct you in faith. When it comes and your shoulder's up against the wall, you've got to have a man of faith. A man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. And this is what faith is all about. Jesus said, the works that I do, you'll do also. And greater works than these shall he do because I go to my Father. Now Jesus meant that. He meant it just as much as he said, I came to do the Father's will. He meant the Word of God. 
And we are to be doing the works of God. Not drawing attention to ourselves. Not getting on a big TV network and saying, this is who I am, you better bow down and worship me. That's not what he's talking about. God is saying, I want you to do the work of God as a body of believers. I want you to do the work of God so it will not draw attention to you, but it will continue to draw attention to Christ. When Christ was on earth and He did the works of God, it drew attention to Him, but it, not really Him as a man. It drew attention to God the Father. He glorified God the whole time He was here. He didn't want people to brag on Him. Don't brag on me. Don't tell it in the town. Let God receive all the glory. And if we do the works in Jesus' name, God will still receive all the glory. Faith. Put faith at your fingertips. It's been in my fingertips. I've been reading this device all night, talking about faith. <laughs> and that's what we want to do. Put faith at our fingertips where we can get a hold of it. You have it. You activate it by speaking God's Word, and you stand on it. Faith and Pentecostal power go together. The preceding message has been a production of Tony Broom Ministries. 